Welcome back to another episode of Too Close to Home, the series where we dig up creepy stories, haunted places and mysteries from our very own Patreon's hometowns. In this episode, we're looking at CJ, Daniel, Nicholas, Danny and David, and we have some good stories in store for you five. Remember, if you want us to dig up stories from your local area, then head on over to Patreon and join our Too Close to Home tier. We're also working on a Too Close to Home interactive map that will allow you to punch in your postcode and see creepy stories, true crime events, haunted places and mysteries in your area. It's basically a way to find out if many of the topics we cover on this channel are actually closer to your home than you think. We'll be populating the map on a regular basis, so be sure to bookmark the website and check your location regularly to see what lies just a little too close to home. Now, if you haven't already done so, we'd like to make a special request to CJ, Daniel, Nicholas, Danny, and David to hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Utica. Utica in New York State is located on the Mohawk River at the foot of the Adirondack Mountains. It is known for its rich culture, natural resources, and stunning scenery, and our much valued patron CJ is lucky enough to live there. For you, CJ, we'll first look at the Potato Hill Killer. It all began on April 26, 1973, when Utica resident Mary Turner was suffering from insomnia and decided to take a late night stroll to see if it would help. The 56 year old mother of five walked from her apartment towards Steuben and walked past a gas station where 33 year old Bernard Hatch was working the night shift. In the morning, a local man named James Weekly was walking along Potato Hill Road when he saw a green car dragging what looked like a white object behind it. Initially he thought nothing of it, but later when he made his return trip, he noticed a bloody drag mark in the road. He followed the substance to a trail where he discovered remnants of clothing and what appeared to be internal organs. Believing the organs were human, Weekly phoned the police. His suspicions were confirmed and after search dogs were brought in, a grave was unearthed where a horrifically mutilated female body was found, footless, armless and faceless, with just an ear and some hair above her neck remaining. Bernard Hatch, who had a green car, quickly became the lead suspect, and a search of his house revealed the tools he had used to dismember the body. Hatch was formally indicted on murder charges on October 17, 1973. His trial was, and remains, the longest in Odida County history, and he was not sentenced until April 1976, when he received 25 years to life. Whilst awaiting trial, another gruesome discovery was made. The decomposed remains of Hatch's former girlfriend, Linda Cady, and her three-year-old daughter, Lisa. Later that same year, burned clothing was unearthed near to where Mary Turner was found, that was later identified as belonging to Lorraine Zinacola, also a former girlfriend of Hatch. Hatch always denied all the murders and was only convicted of Mary's. He maintained his innocence right up until his death in November 2021. The New York State Lunatic Asylum at Utica This beautifully constructed Greek revival building now lays abandoned apart from the spirits that allegedly roam its interior. Originally known as New York State Lunatic Asylum, it was opened January 16, 1843 and was New York's first state-run facility designed to care for the mentally ill. Sadly, like many of these early institutions, upsetting procedures were practiced on patients, including lobotomies and electroshock therapy. Over the years, stories of horrible living conditions were told, with many claiming that the patients received little to no care and were left confined in small rooms. 
In 1852, the asylum's first floor stairway caught on fire, killing a doctor and a firefighter. Four days later, a barn on the property also caught fire. Eventually, a man by the name of William Spears, a convicted arsonist and former patient of the asylum, confessed to starting both fires because he was upset with one of the hospital employees. The horrifying Utica crib was also created at the asylum by its first director, Dr. Amaria Bryham, as an alternative to chaining patients. The Utica crib was a bed with a thick mattress, slats on the sides, and a hinged top that could be locked from the outside. It was basically a cage. It was used to control unruly patients. The crib was widely viewed as barbaric and compared to a coffin. Many patients died whilst being trapped in the Utica crib. For many years, it's been rumored the abandoned asylum is haunted and those who have explored it share stories of hearing chilling screams and haunting faces of former patients peering out of windows. Many believe the victims of twisted medical procedures still haunt the halls today. The asylum is also notable for Clarissa Caldwell Lathrop, an American social reformer who was unlawfully confined to the asylum through a secret plot to kill her. Her experience led her to devoting her life to ameliorating the laws relating to lunacy. The old asylum is pretty terrifying, and I can't imagine what that's like CJ having that close by. Los Alamos, New Mexico Our value patron Daniel lives in Los Alamos in New Mexico, home to the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Those who are aware of Bob Lazar and his story would have heard about Los Alamos National Laboratory before. It's a place that has been creating world-changing science and technology since the 1940s. Most notably, the first atomic bomb. For you, Daniel, we'll take a look at how that came to be. Los Alamos is the place where during World War II, a secret laboratory was established by the Manhattan Project and operated by the University of California. The laboratory, also known as Project Y, was located in a remote part of New Mexico and occupied buildings that had once been part of the Los Alamos Ranch School. Its mission was to design and build the first atomic bombs. Head of the project, Robert Oppenheimer, chose the site due to its isolation, access to water, and pre-existing buildings. Both Little Boy and Fat Man atomic bombs were designed at the Los Alamos Laboratory. Little Boy was a gun-type fission bomb, the type dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, on the 6th of August 1945, and Fat Man was an implosion-triggered nuclear bomb, like the one detonated by the United States over the Japanese city of Nagasaki on the 9th of August 1945. The two atomic bombs that killed and maimed thousands of people shocked the world, and in the years that followed, many of the survivors would face leukemia, cancer, or other terrible side effects from the radiation. This all started in Los Alamos, Today, the Los Alamos National Laboratory conducts multidisciplinary research in fields such as national security, space exploration, nuclear fusion, and renewable energy, many of which is incredibly secret. There is also tales of UFO and alien research taking place at the lab. That's quite the legacy to have on your doorstep, Daniel. Next up, we'll look at the mystery of Tania Miser's murder. Sometime between 10.45 on July 6th, 1981 and 1.33 p.m. on July 7th, 1981, Tania M. Meisner became the first murder victim in Los Alamos, New Mexico in almost 32 years. She was just 15 years old. Tania and her family had moved to Los Alamos in 1967 when she was a baby, when her father took a job at the National Lab. It was a good place to live and bring up a family. The house on 48th Street, where Tanya spent most of her 15 years, is situated on a north-south running street at the westernmost edge of town. However, the family's idyllic life came to a halt in December 1979, when Tanya's father was involved in a serious car crash that eventually took his life. By this time, only two of the Meisner's six children still lived at home, Tanya and her brother John. 
but tragedy would strike the family again on July 6th, 1981, when Tanya was found dead in their home. The autopsy revealed Tanya had been strangled and sexually assaulted, and a homicide investigation was pursued. A prime suspect was soon identified, however the grand jury declined to indict him, and by 1986, the statute of limitations on manslaughter charges had run out. The suspect was never publicly named. In 1987, nurses Patrick Smith and his wife Rosemary were found murdered in their home in Clarksville, Tennessee. The investigation quickly led police to the doorstep of Ronnie Cawthorn and Brett Patterson, and both were later convicted of the crime. Brett received two life sentences, while Ronnie was sentenced to death. Fast forward to 2005, DNA tests revealed that Brett Patterson very likely had sexual intercourse with Tanya prior to her death. He was the suspect way back in 1981, and he was almost certain to be her killer. However, because he was a teenager at the time, he was never named, and for some reason never arrested. If he had been, it would have brought justice to Tanya, and two other lives would have been saved. Over 20 years later, Patterson has still not been indicted for the death and violation of Tanya Meisner. Lastly, we'd like to mention the Bandelier National Monument, which was designed by President Woodrow Wilson in 1916. This national monument in Los Alamos is said to be haunted by ghost lights, the sounds of crying and moaning, and strange mists that can be seen at nighttime. Daniel, we'd love to know if you've ever experienced anything strange at the monument. And if not, maybe you should take a visit there at night and see for yourself if the tales are true. Kolding in Denmark Kolding is a Danish seaport located at the head of Koldingfjord in the region of southern Denmark. It is known as being an extremely friendly and welcoming place, with streets lined with cherry trees, and our patron Danny is lucky enough to call it home. However, we have a very strange story for you, Daniel, about a cat. It's unusual for a domestic cat to cause someone's death, but sadly, that is what happened to Henrik Pletten from Kolding. He adopted a cat and her kittens in 2018, but when he was moving them, he was bitten by one of the cats. Initially, he thought nothing of it. However, a few hours later, his hand had swollen to double its normal size. After seeing a doctor, he ended up in Colding Hospital, where he stayed for a month and had 15 operations. But his finger was still not fully healed, and it was eventually amputated. For years after the incident, Henrik suffered with ill health that could not be explained. It turns out the cat had bitten right into a blood vessel, leaving behind hogenic bacteria in his bloodstream that began to circulate around his body. He struggled for four years with ill health directly linked to the bite, and at the age of just 33, he died in 2022. His family went public with the news to raise awareness of just how serious a cat bite can be. Next up, we'll take a look at the royal castle called Coldingus. The castle was originally built in the 13th century, so it was very old, although there have been bits added to it over the years. The oldest remaining part was built by King Christopher III, who reigned from 1441 to 1448, when he died at the age of 31. Although it was built as a fortress, and he never actually lived there, King Christian III was the first king to make it his residence, and subsequent kings also lived there. During the Napoleonic Wars in 1808, Spanish soldiers arrived and were quartered at Coldingus under the supervision of their French commander. However, the Scandinavian was too cold for the soldiers, and they huddled around furnaces and stoves, and even set furniture alight to keep warm. This contributed to the fire that later engulfed the building. The fire was discovered too late to save the main buildings, and for several decades was just a ruined landmark. Many years later, it was restored to replicate the original castle, and it was completed in 1991. Today, Coldingus is a modern museum and a world-class attraction. We couldn't find any stories online about it being haunted, but with as much history as it has, we have no doubt that it is. During our research of Colding, we also found two mysterious bunkers, hidden in shrubs, 
surrounded by residential houses. For many years, it seems that no one really knew exactly what these bunkers were. It turns out they most likely date back to the Second World War, and housed telephone repeaters and operators served telephones. But we couldn't find a whole lot about them. Pretty interesting though. Lastly, we'd like to mention a story that dates back to 2015. A jogger was taking an early morning run along the shores of Colding Ford when he discovered a decomposing body. A full-scale police investigation was launched and the death was considered suspicious. However, at least here in the UK, we cannot find any more information about this event. This was eight years ago and we're not entirely sure if the case was ever solved or if it went cold. Sidcup, London Borough of Bexley. Sidcup is an area of southeast London, England. It now comes under the London Borough of Bexley. But prior to the creation of Greater London in 1965, it was in the county of Kent. The name Sidcup was first recorded in 1254 and is derived from Old English words meaning either a fold in a hill or seat shaped or flat topped hill. And our patron David calls Sidcup his home. For you, David, we'll first look at the sad case of Rob Knox. Rob Knox was a budding young actor, and although not one of the main characters, he appeared in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince as Ravenclaw's Marcus Balby, and had been signed up to appear in the next instalment. It was not his first acting job, he had already appeared in British film and TV, as well as Junior Masterchef. The Half-Blood Prince wrapped up filming on May 18th, 2008, but just a week after, tragedy would strike for 18-year-old Rob. He was enjoying a night out in Sidcup with his younger brother Jamie. The pair were drinking at what was then the Metro Bar, next to Sidcup Railway Station. 22-year-old Carl Bishop came to the bar, but was refused entry after having caused an incident the week before. Bishop took the refusal badly and went outside and punched someone before fleeing the scene. However, he returned wielding two knives. At this point, Jamie, who was waiting outside the car, tried to intervene, but Bishop threatened him. Rob was told what was going on and went out to protect his brother. A brawl broke out and Rob and three others were stabbed. Rob was rushed to hospital but sadly died of his injuries. He never got to see his appearance in one of the biggest film franchises of all time when it premiered in July 2009, where all his Harry Potter co-stars wore white wristbands to pay tribute to him. Next up we have the story of Lesnes Abbey. The ruins of Lesnes Abbey are located in Bexley, just outside of Sidcup. They date back to 1178. Lesnes was one of the first monasteries to be closed after the dissolution of the monasteries in 1534, when most of the buildings were demolished and some of the stone was recycled and used in the construction of nearby Hall Place. The abbey was effectively lost before more recently being restored to show some of the walls and the entire outline of the abbey. As you would expect, the area is no stranger to myths and legends. The surrounding woodlands are said to be haunted by a monk who was killed for being caught with a woman. There is also a phantom horseman who inhibits the historic landmark. To add to the legends, a creepy photograph was taken in the 1930s that appears to show the shadowy figure of an apparition wearing a tunic, leggings and pointy shoes. The photo had been passed down to the family of a local resident by a man named James Preston. Apparently the photograph has been tested by experts who believe that it is not fake or a double exposure. The family believe it's the spirit of Richard de Lucy, the founder of the original Abbey. What do you think, David? And have you ever paid a visit to the Abbey? Pasadena, Texas. Pasadena, Texas is located between Houston and Deer Park in southeastern Harris County and is known as the strawberry capital of the region. Every year they hold a strawberry festival and our patron Nicholas lives there so we hope he likes strawberries. For you, Nicholas, we'll first take a look at the home of a notorious serial killer. The property is located on 2020 Lama Drive. In 2022, 
2020 Lama Drive Pasadena went up for sale for nearly $185,000. It was listed as a newly renovated home located in Pasadena, freshly painted to make it warm and welcoming, with a big backyard to host family and friends. But what it failed to mention was that the house was the former home of serial killer Dean Coral, and it was where, as recently as 2021, police were still looking for his victims in and around his former homes. Dean Coral abducted, raped, tortured, and murdered at least 28 teenage boys and young men between 1970 and 1973 in Houston and Pasadena, Texas. He was known locally as the Candy Man because his family used to own a candy factory in Houston Heights. He was aided by two teenage accomplices, David Owen Brooks and Alma Wayne Henley. The crimes, which became known as the Houston Mass Murders, came to light after Henley fatally shot Coral at 2020 Lama Drive in 1973. Coral and his accomplices typically lured victims to his home with the promise of drink, drugs, and a party. They would then be restrained, either by force or deception, and each was killed either by strangulation or shooting. Most of the victims were buried either in a rented boat shed or in a woodlands, with one being found on a beach. After Coral was killed, Brooks and Henley confessed to assisting him in several abductions and murders, and led police to the brutal spots, and both were sentenced to life imprisonment at their subsequent trials. Now this is a house that I would not want to be living in. How far away are you from this house, Nicholas? That must be incredibly eerie to walk past, knowing the horrors that took place inside. Next up, we'll take a look at the haunted apartment building. First Line Apartments on 1120 Red Bluff Road have long been rumored to be haunted. Residents have reported strange occurrences over the years, and many have witnessed the apparition of an unknown woman in a white dress walking the hallways. One visitor to the apartment, now an adult, recalls an incident when she was around six years old and visiting a friend. Their mother sat in the kitchen drinking coffee and told the two girls to go and play in the bedroom. The friend's bedroom was situated at the end of the hallway, so you could see into it from the kitchen. As the two girls walked down the hallway, they could see a strange woman in the bedroom kneeling over a toy box. The woman wore a white dress and seemed to be putting something in the box before she slowly stood up and walked towards a hidden part of the bedroom. The girls ran towards the bedroom to see who the woman was, but she had vanished. The visiting girl wanted to tell her mum, but the other girl wanted to look into her toy box first. Inside, they found a tatty-looking doll with a dirty face and dark hair. Neither of them had seen the doll before, but thought it must have been a gift from the lady. After the incident, the girl who lived in the apartment started to carry the raggy doll everywhere and started spending long periods staring into space and whispering to the doll. A few weeks after the doll was found, the visiting girl spent the night with her friend in the apartment but was woken in the middle of the night by her friend whispering, and to her horror, realized that she had cut all of her hair off with scissors. Things got even stranger as the girl grew older, and eventually she ended up stabbing her mum in the apartment with a kitchen knife. Thankfully, the mum survived, but the girl was eventually institutionalized. Her friend firmly believes that the ghost woman and the evil doll were responsible for her change in behavior all of which took place at the apartment block on 1120 Red Bluff Road. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We'd like to give a very special thank you to CJ, Daniel, Nicholas, Danny and David. We hope you enjoyed these stories from your hometown. Remember everyone else, if you'd like to hear creepy tales, mysteries, unexplained disappearances, crimes, haunted locations and anything else strange that we can find about your hometown, then head on over to Patreon to find out more. Also, don't forget to check out our Too Close to Home interactive map to see what could be lurking on your doorstep. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.